and I'm delighted to welcome to this rather strange event because it's a seminar and a book launch. I'm quite sure how it's going to work, but we'll find out. Um, and I'm delighted that uh, George is here to present his book and contents thereof. And he's brought with him an all-star panel <laughs> um, who are going to uh, respond to what he has to say in their various ways. Um, I don't think I need to say much more. Over to you, George. Sure. Okay, I'll stand up for my bit. Um, yeah, I'll start by saying thank you to, to Colin um, and the Voluntary Action History Society generally for, for hosting today. It's, it's a very fitting uh, society to host, I think. Um, since while I was doing the research for this book, this, the, the VHS was very much a kind of academic home from home for me. So it feels fitting. Um, and thank you also to the uh, people we have here today, who you're going to hear from afterwards. I asked them to say a few words, sort of, um, to speak to the themes of this book, um, as well as perhaps saying how, how wrong I've got in the book itself, <laughs> we'll find out. Um, but what I want to do uh, is really before, oh and I should say, of course, that um, thank you as well to you for being here. There are people who can't be here today, um, including the uh, series editor and the, the editor at Manchester University Press, who both wanted to, to be here but couldn't, since we're clashing with a number of events in Bristol and Manchester and elsewhere. Um, but they did both want to be here, and the uh, Manchester University Press editor in particular asked that um, if anyone's tweeting about today, which you're very welcome to do, then if you could um, sort of use at Manchester UP, they'd be very grateful to know what's going on in their name. Um, but before we come to, to kind of, uh, kind of discussion about some of the themes, I just want to run through a few things. I'll speak for, for I'll, so I'll try and keep it to, to about 30 minutes, no more, sort of about half of our hour slot, and then we'll have sort of short comments from, from else. And before that, I just want to, to say a bit about a few things, so some basic questions really. You know, why did I write this book? Um, what is the book about? Um, what have I found out through doing the research that's presented here? And ultimately, why should anyone care? What is it about this book that helps us to understand the past or to use the past to understand issues that we're facing today and perhaps the NHS is facing as it looks ahead to a challenging future? So really, I should start off with a person who's not here today, and that would be my nan, um, Vera Pelli, who, when I um, spoke to her a number, about a decade ago now, and said to her that I was, as well as researching history, researching at university this thing called social policy, and explained what on earth that was, um, she responded with a question, asking me why things were the way they were in her childhood in the 30s. Why, when her father was sick, in, uh, when they lived in St. Wurlburg, a, a working class neighbourhood in the east of Bristol, why, when he was sick, did she have to go on a walk two miles uphill to the plush suburbs of Henleys to go and see the vicar and ask for a dispensary ticket, and then take it on another walk down into the central Bristol um, to cash it in at the dispensary for medicines before taking another walk uh, back home to take the medicines back to him, a six-mile round walk up and down some serious hills, a big challenge for little legs days. Why, she asked me, was it like that? Why couldn't they just go to the GP on the NHS and get treated for free? And really, I've spent the last 10 years finding out. So, uh, what I focus on in this book is, is not the dispensary system, but the, the hospital system alongside it. Um, so I should say a few words about the types of hospitals that were around at the time. Um, really, we can look at public and voluntary hospitals at the time. Uh, and the public hospitals, the kind of things that you would see up here. On the left-hand side is, is um, infectious disease hospitals, often tuberculosis sanatoria. And by the 20th century, these had kind of progressed from being sort of dumping grounds, kind of places where quarantine was kind of giving way to much more sophisticated models of care. And then on the right-hand side, you also get the, um, the uh, poor law infirmaries, kind of sick wards for the workhouses, which were slowly in the 20th century becoming, at least in name, um, more uh, uh, municipal hospitals for the community at large. Um, and there's these hospitals between them very much provided the majority <coughs> of the hospital beds at the time, um, but they have got a negative press. And historians have debated just how much the stigma of poverty and pauperism blighted this public hospital system. But certainly, if you could, that's not where you wanted to end up with the chronic and aged sick. If you could, you would want to end up in the voluntary hospitals, uh, which very much dominated the provision of acute medical services. Um, and there was a huge range in what we might talk about as voluntary hospitals here. It might be the kind of things you see on the bottom, sort of converted houses, 
Um, in the case on the left, the Dartford case, a cottage hospital, which is really more a GP who's dabbling in, in minor surgery. Um, the kind of thing we increasingly see today with um, minor surgery units. Or it might be something like what you see on the right there, um, which is the, the uh, a specialist hospital. So that's the old girls' ward in the, the old version of the Bristol Children's Hospital. Somewhere I probably spent a bit too much time myself as a child. Um, and these were smaller institutions, but you also got the kind of the big grand medical institutions of the day, places like Guy's Hospital or Edinburgh Infirmary, you can see there. Um, and when we're thinking of voluntary hospitals, a lot of these are still the, the big main hospitals today. Really anything with infirmary in the title, and most things with Royal or, or Victoria in the title as well, are going to be these kinds of hospitals. Um, and these hospitals were voluntary in a number of senses, partly because they were independent of the state, but also because they were founded as charities um, over the 18th, 19th, and in some cases in the 20th centuries too, um, principally for the treatment of the sick poor. Um, and the idea here was very much that the middle and upper classes would support these hospitals through um, their subscriptions, donations, benefactions, and then, on the other side, it would be the working classes um, who would be receiving treatment there. And they would do so um, by the kind of system that my nan described, by going to um, somebody, perhaps their local employer, somebody who would be um, of the kind of, of person who might be a hospital subscriber, and getting a ticket for, to cash in for admission to the hospitals. But this system wasn't really the, the, the main thing that was used for entering hospitals by the time my nan was remembering the 1930s. So what this book is really about is, is what happened, what replaced this sort of, of traditional philanthropic model that was around by the time um, the NHS came in the 1940s. And really what we're talking about here are four um, sort of new arrivals in the hospital. Um, and I should say that this was a time of, of great change for the hospitals. It was a time particularly of change in terms of, uh, of medical technology and the scientific capacities of the hospital. To put it simply, you can't put an x-ray machine in a doctor's bag. So this is a time when the hospital can do more, but it can also often afford less because of rather challenging <coughs> circumstances. So the question is, at a time when medicine can do more and reach more people, and we start to get the idea that hospitals should be providing services for the whole community, how do they go about that? And one of the ways the voluntary hospitals sought to diversify their funding um, in the hope of increasing income to meet the challenges of this coming era of mass medicine was by bringing in patient payment schemes, the first of these four new arrivals. This was not entirely new in the 1920s. The precedent had been set by the admission of private patients in London and occasionally elsewhere in the late 19th century. But the interwar years saw the establishment of payments for all categories of patients, middle and working class, uh, far more widely. And their introduction may appear on first glance to be ensuring that the voluntary hospitals were operating a sort of private healthcare system in the interwar years. But we should not assume, simply because payment was involved, that this was a commercial arrangement. What we need to do, and what this book does, is to consider what payment actually meant in practice. And although the schemes varied from hospital to hospital, because before the NHS there was no national system, uh, we can discern some typical features, three of which I think are particularly important. The first is that rather than covering medical services, payment actually went to, towards the cost of maintenance, while doctors offered their services um, gratuitously as before. Um, and offering their services without a fee was not necessarily an act of altruism. It bolstered their credentials um, for some rather lucrative private practice beyond the hospitals. Uh, and the second thing we should... So this means that the, the payments we're looking at here are less medical fees and more sort of hospital boarding charge. Um, but as well as this, the typical rate of payment of being around one guinea per week for an inpatient, 21 shillings, uh, this covered less than one third of the actual cost of the treatment being provided. So far from being a kind of for-profit model, this was still heavily subsidised care. And then thirdly, and importantly, <coughs> something gets overlooked often, there was a mass system of exemptions and reductions that ensured the payments were not a barrier to access. So when we're looking at the pre-NHS hospital payment systems, this is less uh, a private system of private medical fees and more one of means-tested medical charity. And when this, these new systems were being brought in, there was also a new figure who arrived in the hospital in order to police this system, and this was the Lady Almoner. Um, gradually, between the 1930s and 60s, the Almoner would be rebranded as the medical social worker. 
Um, but the original name was solution to dealing with money in the sense of distributing arms. The first hospital almoners were co-opted from the Charity Organisation Society. The COS was a, a, a society that sought to instill discipline in the Victorian world of philanthropy. But by the time the NHS arrived, the almoner was dealing with various aspects of aftercare and social support that would fall into the fields today, not only of social work, but also occupational health. However, the first appointment of an almoner at the Royal Free Hospital in 1985, um, and in others across the capital at the turn of the century, were focused on preventing abuse. And abuse in this case meant the free admission um, and care of those who could afford to pay but, and were not the intended recipients of medical charity. So her job, and the almoner was almost always her, um, her job was not to decide who should receive treatment, but instead to determine the, term, determine the terms of admission. Um, she could recommend that people be sent instead to the workhouse um, if their circumstances were primarily ones to do with poverty rather than sickness, or she could exclude those who were not poor enough uh, to receive them at the hospital's charity. But usually her task was deciding at what rate payment should be asked for. Um, and I think this is uh, an important thing here, what we see here is a system around the almoner which is largely overlooked in the history of Britain's hospitals, uh, and yet it very much becomes a uh, kind of established feature of the system. Um, even while at times the almoner uh, might be resented by those who, those who she's asking for money, I haven't found any evidence that there was any real attempt to resist or, or refuse to pay. This seems to become part of the established order quickly. And there was an alternative to the almoner's assessment with the questioning of a middle class social worker and the possibility of a significant lump sum being asked. And this came in the form of the hospital contributory schemes. These were mutual societies that operated by taking a deduction of typically two or three pence a week from their members' wages and then in return paying any hospital fees if they were admitted. But um, pinning down exactly what they, they were, a little more than that, can be a bit tricky because they, they kind of... Uh, they had very varied origins. Um, some were rooted in the charitable hospital Saturday and Sunday collection funds, um, while others came out of workplace collections. And in some cases, it was the hospitals themselves who established these schemes as a sort of fundraising exercise. Um, schemes in different areas also adopted different sort of policies. Um, for example, those in Newcastle and Glasgow pushed for an open door policy, whereby once they provided the funding, access was provided universally and free at the point of use. And for this reason, I think we can see why they've often been held as sort of forerunners of the NHS. Yet at the same time, um, other schemes were adopting a style more like that of commercial insurance, and including a range of additional benefits, both in cash and kind. Um, I think one thing we have to keep in mind here with hospital contributory schemes, um, these have been the area of, of, of hospital care and sort of medical charity that has been uh, very much the focus of historians' attention, to the point of really excluding um, the almoner from the story altogether. Um, part of what we see with these hospital contributory schemes is an idea that they are effectively wiping away the old philanthropic system, instead bringing about a new, universal, more democratic model of healthcare. Um, yet in actual fact, it really should be understood as a parallel and alternative to the almoner's means-tested system. Um, while both contributory schemes and the almoner's assessment provided ways for working class patients to make a financial contribution to the hospital, membership of a scheme didn't necessarily mean they were buying access, but it did give them one advantage. It gave them a degree of empowerment and control over how exactly that contribution was managed. Um, and if there's one thing that's been um, left out is, is being the Lady Almoner, there's also very little mention in the history that's been written so far of the income limits that she was policing. Um, what you had here was a system of income limits that barred middle class patients from being admitted to the ordinary wards of the voluntary hospitals. Um, but at the same time, increasingly over the early 20th century, uh, the voluntary hospitals, and some public hospitals too, were increasingly setting aside rooms for those who could afford to pay. <coughs> These rooms were the, the sort of thing that you see here. They would typically be one, occasionally two bed rooms that would be much more um, luxurious surroundings, much more domestic in their style than the sort of dormitory wards that you might find for working class patients. Um, and there was also a difference in terms of how payment operated for these. For these private patients, the, the fees were far higher 
um, sometimes ten times higher than the full rate being asked that might be asked for in the uh, ordinary wards. And these fees were not voluntary, and they were not adjusted according to the, the, the means of the patient. They were compulsory fees, in addition to which you'd have to negotiate a, a private fee with your own doctor or surgeon on top. Now, this is perhaps the area of hospital medicine where we might expect to see the greatest growth. Um, this, uh, for a number of reasons, this is uh, this was the only sort of uh, hospital provision that was available for the middle classes who, uh, who might now, with the advances being made in medical science, increasingly see the benefit of being treated in hospital. Um, and of course, the advances in medical science that were going on also meant that treatment in the home was ever more unrealistic, even for those who could otherwise afford it. In addition to which, the hospitals were increasingly needing to find new sources of income. So we really would expect this to be the kind of the big growth area, um, since it was the only area of hospital medicine that could actually turn a profit. Yet what we actually find, um, and really that assumption has been something that's circulated in a lot of, the, of what's been written, but what, what I've found is very much that was not the case. The voluntary hospitals, as I found them, were either unable or unwilling to exploit this attractive new market. Um, with the medical profession in particular forcefully favouring uh, a maintenance of the division between their lucrative private and their charitable hospital work. Um, and what we see here is that this is actually very limited in scale. Even on the eve of the NHS, um, at its peak, we only find around 3 or 4% of all hospital beds in Britain being for this middle class section of population. The only um, provision which was open to the sort of uh, 12 or 15% patients who would be above the income limits. And although this was growing up until the Second World War, it remained um, very much a marginal and minimal feature of the hospital system. Now, this is something which kind of goes against a lot of what's been written. Um, there is an assumption which has a kind of a, sort of a, a political purchase, particularly on the left today, that any sort of old sort of um, you know, compassionate charitable model of healthcare had, that we might associate with the old hospitals have been sort of killed off and washed away. And what in fact was around um, by the 1930s and 40s to be replaced by the NHS was essentially a model in the voluntary hospitals of private healthcare. And this is still something that crops up in a number of the, the more recent academic works on this. Um, this is something which, for example, even the sort of late great medical historian John Pixon talked about as being an invasion of the hospital field by commercial medicine. And yet when we actually look at the numbers, and this book is the first to, to actually put together numbers that, that reach across the whole country, not just using King's uh, <coughs> statistics for London. When we actually look at the numbers, they tell quite a different story, one in which private provision for the middle classes was far more limited than we might assume, and free provision and free treatment for the poor was actually much more common. And we can see this not only when we look at the numbers, but also when we think spatially about the hospital. When we actually look at where um, this treatment is being provided, the kind of rival myth we get is either that um, charity had given way to private medicine in order, in time for it to be nationalised by Night Devon, or that what we had was in fact a kind of new kind of uh, proto NHS, something that provided a universal service and a much more democratic way of doing it, bringing people together in the hospital <coughs> as medical science brought people into the hospital for their treatment. And yet, this isn't what we see either. Um, these sorts of, of, of beds were, and these wards were physically separate from the, the ordinary wards that were being provided uh, to working class patients. Um, in some cases this was uh, because they had to be, because of the charitable trustees of the hospital, which said that the actual facilities built with those donations had to be for the sick poor, um, which even stretching it as much as you could, say, it would, be, it would be kind of mean and uncharitable to leave out the wealthy from the, from the best and latest medical technologies. Is a line that you've tried. Um, even despite that, um, you couldn't quite sell the idea that these sort of uh, high paying patients were the sick poor. So, in some cases, you have to build a new building to, to treat them. In other cases, you might have to turf the nurses out of the nurses' home to put the private patients in there. But even when it was in the same building, they would be physically separate, often on a different floor, in order to minimize the sort of social anxieties and embarrassments of middle and working class patients rubbing up alongside each other in the hospital. So the idea that you get from some of the work, particularly that was done in the 1990s, 
that the old philanthropic model had been swept aside by a new, more democratic one, doesn't seem to be borne out when we actually look at physically what was happening in the hospitals. What we see here instead, I would suggest, and I've talked about this the, using the phrase class differentiation to try and pin it down, what we see here instead is in fact um, the kind of social hierarchies and class distinctions that are at the heart of philanthropy actually being brought in-house in the hospital. Those same distinctions and power dynamics being played out outside of the hospital are actually brought within its walls by this process. Now there's another way in which we might, so one of the things we see here is that this is actually confusing to perhaps some of our narratives about change and continuity. That actually we're seeing these big changes, um, but actually in some cases they're more administrative and practical than they are actually getting to the social dynamics of the hospital. So what we see here perhaps are superficial um, changes, that actually underneath them there are some greater continuities going on. And this is something that we also <coughs> see in a, in a slightly different area. Uh, when we're looking at what I've termed economic reciprocalism. Now, this is um, what we get to when we actually ask what function paying the hospital actually paid um, for the vast majority of working class patients who were not these, these uh, sort of commercial style uh, middle class patients. For these patients, uh, payment did not buy access to medical treatment since this was already being provided free or subsidized according to their means. Um, so it was not a commercial service that they were buying, but neither was medical care being provided as a right of citizenship. What we see here, actually, I would suggest, is a reinvention of the old sort of model of reciprocity that has always been at the heart of, of philanthropy. Now, this is where patients um, and recipients of medical charity are having to respond in some way. So in the old model, the old perhaps Victorian model, of reciprocity, um, a patient can't actually respond by returning the gift or on equal terms. So what you have to do instead is demonstrate and play out and act your deservingness to receive it. You have to act according to a kind of Victorian moral code whereby things like thrift, um, piety, sobriety are hugely important in demonstrating that you're the right kind of person to receive this medical charity. Now, you're not acting out this kind of moral code in the same way now, but I, what, I, what I would suggest in what I suggest in this book is that actually it is a renewed and reinvented form of reciprocity that we're seeing here. Not demonstrating a sort of upright moral code, but in, in your behaviour uh, more broadly, but specifically around financial <coughs> contribution, um, whereby contributing or either contributing or submitting to the almoner's means test to prove your willingness to contribute is a form of, of submission and deference, demonstrating um, both that you are willing, you're not a free rider, you're willing to contribute, but also demonstrating a kind of, of good management of your household finances, um, demonstrating thrift in a kind of renewed form. Ultimately, what we see here, I, I'm suggesting, is that the, the bringing in of different classes into the hospital is not so much bringing about a universal uh, model of provision, but a, highly differentiated one, whereby civic responsibilities have primacy um, of over and above, over, above and beyond um, any idea of a right to health care. So, so I just want to move on to my kind of final question asking here, like why is this important, what does this tell us? And I think it tells us things both if we're wanting to look back and understand the past on its own terms, but also if we want to use the past to understand the challenges that we're facing today or perhaps questions we might ask about what free care might look like, what its boundaries might be within the NHS. Um, and I think, as I've suggested, this kind of gives us ideas of change and continuity that we can ask here. And these are always important when we're looking at the interwar years. Um, we have this kind of underlying question whenever we're looking at the, this period. Is this really the echoes of a long Victorian age? Or are we seeing here a kind of prelude to the post-war years, the kind of foundations to our best states, perhaps? And what I'm suggesting here is, is that the, the kind of the changes which seem so dominant, and there were many changes, particularly um, around uh, the kind of capacities of medical science in the hospital and the mechanisms by which that was delivered and organized. There were huge changes there. Yet when we look beneath that at the social dynamics and relationships underpinning this system, actually continuity seems to be much more striking. 
than change would suggest. And I think understanding the, what came before the NHS is important if we want to understand the NHS better. Um, we often hear politicians talking about the founding principles of the NHS and how they're living up to them. And yet, I think it, if we really want to know what it meant to, to found the NHS, we need to understand what it was replacing. Um, uh, and in this case, I think understanding that it was not a, a private system that was being abolished, or a kind of a democratic new model that was being nationalised and universalised. Understanding instead that what we're seeing are the other class and uh, social distinctions of philanthropy that are being brushed aside as the, the kind of relationship between contributing and receiving uh, medical care is not only being separated but entirely divorced. That seems to me to be far more um, central. And more broadly, I think, um, this episode of what is effectively payment being introduced into a free hospital system, this, I think, resonates with some of the, the insights from another field beyond medical um, history, um, which is that of, of economic sociology. Um, and since the 1980s, there have been some really important and interesting works um, done in that, in, in that field under the banner of the new economic sociology. For example, Mark Granovato in the 1980s writing about how um, economic behaviour can never be truly disembedded from its social context. Or Viviana Zaliza from the 1990s talking about the social meaning of money and money handling practices, suggesting that some of our kind of d deepest held ideas that money is this kind of universal and blank token which has only the meaning that we ascribe to it, only the value that we ascribe to it. Actually, uh, money can be inscribed with many, many more meanings, and actually, um, they can, can cover a range of social and cultural and moral and legal and religious meanings. With, and the, the money itself and the practices around handling money can effectively become a kind of broadcaster for those vast societal values. This seems to me to resonate with, with some of what we're seeing here, where the new act of paying the hospital. Um, in this, we see that, that, that pain does not automatically make for an empowered consumer, but neither does it necessarily signal the triumph of commercial values. And I think that we, we see this, for example, also when, once we look into the history of the NHS, the very fact that the introduction of prescription charges doesn't fundamentally um, erode or displace the principle of free at the point of use. Um, the two have much more complicated relationships. Um, but just to, to, to wrap up and end on this point, I think when we want to understand the past on its own terms, I think what we might say is that the, um, the kind of, when we're looking at this system, what was in place by the time that my bedroom was nationalising the hospitals, the idea that the old charitable system had been kind of brushed aside, um, really I think this has been overstated. And uh, what we find instead when we look at the social dynamics and relationships underpinning that system, is that medical charity was actually far from dead uh, by the time socialised medicine arrived in Britain in 1948. Well, thank you very much, Joel. Um, we'll, we'll give give you a full vote of thanks at the end of the evening. Uh, but uh, park that for the moment because we're going to move on and invite uh, our panel members to continue. I'd like to ask uh, Pat Thane to make the first contribution. Thanks, Colin. <coughs> right, well, I was very pleased to see George's book. I very much enjoyed reading it, Mike. I learned a lot. And it certainly deepens our understanding of hospital provision making before the National Health Service. And perhaps also why a change as major as the introduction of the NHS could be introduced relatively calmly with little overt opposition once Baden calmed the BMA down by stuffing their mouths with gold, as he, as he put it, <coughs> letting them continue private practice. I think perhaps at least the, one of George's findings that struck me most strongly <coughs> was his ex stress on the extent to which the better off users <coughs> of the services of voluntary hospitals willingly paid sufficient to subsidise poorer patients, and knew they were doing it, regarding this as part of their duty as citizens. <clears throat> also that poorer people could expect free or low-cost treatment. George writes in the final sentence of the book, payment in the voluntary hospitals was 
a bulwark against the social democratic principle of patients as citizens with a right to treatment. And yet earlier, he quotes a comment from Bristol's first almoner in 1921 that charity as represented by voluntary hospitals has become so much part of the established order that it's often not regarded as charity at all, including by patients receiving free treatment, which suggests that free treatment was close to being regarded as a citizen right by at least some people in Bristol. And I think these attitudes on the part of richer and poorer patients may have made <clears throat> the transition to an NHS free at the point of delivery seem almost a natural transition <clears throat> or acceptable. Free healthcare became a right of citizens, paid to according to means through the tax system, <clears throat> to which even poorer people contributed through indirect taxes. So it's, it appears like a change in the methods of redistribution and reciprocity rather than in the basic principle. Or we are be to know whether any people thought of it in that way. One thing I'd like to know more about, though, is how much experiences of hospitals varied around the country. In the book, we hear about, quite a lot about that on the part of the middle classes but not so much about poorer people. And Bristol was a relatively well-off area, though the poverty survey still showed significant levels of poverty. <clears throat> it had a number of voluntary hospitals from which poor people benefited. But what was happening in poorer areas suffering long-term unemployment? <clears throat> For example, Jarrow, the shipbuilding town in the northeast, which had 77% of its workforce that were unemployed in the mid-1930s, what sort of hospital care was available in places without <clears throat> a substantial middle class to subsidise poorer patients <clears throat> and endow voluntary institutions? I think the reason why Bevan insisted on a national health service rather than the localised one that many of his colleagues like Herbert Morrison wanted, <clears throat> as George describes in the book, one reason for wanting a national service surely was precisely to try to overcome some of these severe regional inequalities in health care and health outcomes. By enabling better off people to subsidise care for poorer people outside their own district, elsewhere in the country, uh, these regional and socioeconomic inequalities have never been eradicated, but it was an aspiration. Also, it was a universal national health service for all classes, partly to ensure that better off people contributed their taxes willingly because they were benefiting. And also, George points out how many lower middle class people particularly <coughs> couldn't afford the full cost of health care and needed a subsidised service. And it, <coughs> it's an important point that he, he makes that relatively few middle-class people use the pre-war voluntary hospitals. He also in the book points out some of the other inequalities in the pre-NHS system, <coughs> which Benton had to eradicate. One was in the differential access of men and women to hospital care. <coughs> women were more rarely in the national insurance system. And certain women, including unmarried mothers, were excluded from voluntary hospitals on moral grounds. <clears throat> and it'd be good to know if there were other groups who failed the Lady Almoner's moral tests, though George does suggest that such tests might vary from one almoner to another, they have a lot of discretion. He also suggests that middle class patients were exempted from involvement in the training functions of the voluntary teaching hospitals. They weren't presented as specimens to trainee doctors, as poorer patients were. I'm assuming this is one reason why teaching hospitals were keen to continue taking poorer patients, especially if they were suffering from interesting conditions. <laughs> they were useful for the training and experimentation. Another thing that I'd like more information about is the finances of pre-war hospitals. We learn from the book and from other sources 
how the costs of medical care rose between the wars. I mean, one thing that's changing is medicine's becoming massively more capable of curing more conditions. But this was costly because uh, it required more pharmaceuticals, new technology, and they cost money. And another reason why state subsidy through the NHS was welcomed to many hospital boards was the relief it brought from this increasing financial pressure. But I would like to know more about how intensely these pressures were being felt before 1948 in the hospitals. And one final, this is just a series of random points that came to mind as I was reading the book. One final point is George only discusses hospitals, which is fair enough. There's only so much you can do in one book. But hospitals aren't the whole of the NHS service. And if poor people often had access to hospital or to a GP, free service was much more rarely available for such essential services as dental or optical care or chiropathy. And if they couldn't afford these services, people used spectacles bought second-hand on a market stall or inherited from relatives, which didn't necessarily do their eyes a lot of good. Or well, they had all their teeth removed and replaced with false ones as 21st birthday presents <laughs> to prevent misery later, which again seems to have been fairly prevalent. Or well, older people were immobilised by bunions and other foot problems. And free access to these services was one of the most transforming features of the NHS, especially for many older people. And it's older people's use of the NHS I, I know most about. Um, that was another reason for the introduction of the free service. And the fact that they hadn't previously been free, these services, also may be why they were the first NHS services to levy charges, because there was no long tradition of free access, except for some national insurance contributors. So charges were rather more acceptable, though under the NHS, poorer people were exempted from the charges. So those are just the thoughts that came to my mind reading. As I say, it was a very stimulating book. Thank you, George. Thank you very much, Pat, for that um, far from random collection of thoughts. <laughs> um, I'd now like to ask uh, Pamela to uh, join in the conversation. To give a really random collection of thoughts. No, 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 not, I, I, I sat down to write this about and it just flowed and that's, that's good because do you know how when you sometimes you sit down and you can't do that and it did. But I want to start by um, congratulating you actually on a great book and, and noting that it was completed at a difficult time in any academic's career which is that time between PhD and first big job and that is a time of Big stress, um, post PhD, early career contact, contracts, seeking job security. So, hats off for finishing it and getting the big job too. Um, and I think also in George's case, it, you know, he, he finished the book whilst taking on other external roles in the field. So, I'm here because we, we work together in the Social History Society, which indeed Pat is a founder member of. And um, George is the communications officer, and I'm the current, current chair. And um, I think. Uh, my husband sometimes thinks, who is George? <laughs> On your emails. <laughs> George's wife is here. <laughs> so we spoke, there's a lot of email traffic between us. So the book is about citizenship. and it's, it's, I just want to say George is an exemplary citizen story. So thank you for that. Um, I also feel a personal connection to the book, because I'm sure, and I'm sure all of us do, because we've all got an NHS story, haven't we, and in our families and in our history and so on and so on. Um, let me just give you two very brief ones. I mean, my, the rest of my family, other than me, are, are, are medical, so, as in nurses, and, um, and so my mother was a, a nurse, my sisters are nurses, my, one of my sisters is still a nurse, diabetes specialist. So I was steeped in the NHS in my family, and you know, if you watch Call the Midwife, <laughs> my, that was my mother. I mean, she was an East End midwife in the 1950s on her bicycle, going uh, <laughs> delivering babies by uh, bike light when the gas meter ran out um, in the East End. And, and she, indeed, she did marry the handsome vicar, although <laughs> from a different part of London. So uh, it's exactly like that. And, and the story she told <coughs> of working at the London Hospital, actually, in the East End, at the Voluntary Hospital, the class dimensions of that hospital were 
unbelievable in the even in, in, in the fifties post post NHS. Um, on another note, my, my father's family history raises the spectre of what it was like not to be able to afford um, care, and I'm sure we've all got that story too. And his uh, sister died at the age of 18 of TB in 1946, and her, her mother, my grandmother, would always say, I can't believe I got her through the war, and then she died at 18 of, of TB. And we're never quite sure, was it because they couldn't afford treatment? Was it, did they fall into that group of being you know, too poor to get public, too rich to go to private. I don't know. Your book made me think about that quite, quite a lot. Um, it made me think lots about, uh, about lots of other things, so I learnt a great deal um, about the complexity, variety and plurality of early 20th century healthcare. I didn't realise it was so complicated, and I, I you know, do the history of social policy, but more criminal justice. Um, I think it also struck me, what struck me was the importance of localism in hi national histories of, of any sort of service and um, the, the, embedding, the importance of local communities in, in creating national services. And some of these, these charities were very you know, locally, locally rooted. And that raises questions about civil society and localism, which I think are very important. And does some of that get swept away with the NHS? Not sure. It's very clear, I think, in the book, this theme about the kind of pernicious but also productive influence of class, um, on the one hand, um, yeah, class justifies these inequalities, on the other hand, it challenges these inequalities, and I think you handle that really nicely in the book. I, I also was thinking about how the British experience sits in relation to the continent. You didn't mention in your summary that really nice part in the, in the intro, which I really enjoyed about, about uh, the, uh, you know, how, how British healthcare sits alongside the American, the French, and the... And the, and the German model, perhaps I need to get out more, but I found that really, really interesting. And what it reminded me of was um, S.B. Anderson's work on uh, Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism. And I think it would make a really nice comparison. I think we need a historical challenge to that book. In fact, there have been lots of other challenges to that book um, from various people. Basically what he does, he's a Danish sociologist, and he looks at Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism, which he describes as... Um, You've got the, you know, the the liberal, the corporate. Sorry, the first of all, the liberal. The second, the corporate status, and the third, the social democratic. And he classically contrasts American sort of liberalism, market-based, you know, privatization with a you know, classic kind of social, Swedish social democratic and, and German French kind of corporate status. But it's never really clear where Britain fits, as ever. You know, we're always kind of you know, and not quite with the Europe, not quite with the states. But and it's also I think partly because of the tradition of the voluntary sector and that survival of the voluntary sector that complicates the picture for, for Britain. So I think you should do a repost to S. Bing Anderson um, as, a, as a historian. I think that would be very interesting. Um, I just want to engage a bit with this idea of the social meaning of payment. And this is, this is one of the big planks of the book, this is one of the arguments of the book. What does it mean when we pay for something? Does that make us just a consumer? And that's, that's your big message, isn't it? That's one of your big arguments here. Um, so you're, you're saying that payment for healthcare has many meanings. It isn't just a case of I'm buying a service, I'm buying a product. It's, in, according to, to, to your argument, George, you're saying um, I am reciprocating, I'm giving back, even though I've got not much choice in the, ma in the matter, so I'm not so sure, but I, I, I think I might take issue with the reciprocity question, but let's see. I mean, you say, um, live from the book, the pre-NHS citizen, sorry, the pre-NHS citizen patient was not so much a citizen consumer as a citizen contributor, and that's really the nub of the, the book, isn't it? That they're, they're giving back on certain terms. And as you say, it's partly because patients are not being charged the full cost of their treatment, they're not being charged and saying, this is how much, this is what your hip replacement costs, this is the bill. That's not what's happening here. They're being charged a contribution to the cost of, of board, apart from anything else, accommodation, meals and cleaning. Um, and which, funnily enough, prisoners used to do as well. I think some really interesting uh, parallels <laughs> that you made there. That, 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 that the prison system used to have, have private rooms for the high, high, you know, for, for better class prison, in the debtors' prison. You know, go back to Dickens mm. in uh, the, the, <coughs> yes, the Marshal Sea. Probably lots of uh, overlap there. Um, so they're not, they're not contributing, they're not buying the treatment, they're contributing to the overall cost and the experience. So, um, and 
I guess you could say, and you use this term in the, in the opening chapters of the book, that what they're in a sense contributing to is a moral economy. It's a, it's a, it's a reinvention of a, of a moral economy, a recasting of the moral economy. What you don't talk about is liberalism in the book. And I think you should talk about liberalism in the book. Is this, is this a continuation or a, re, a recasting of the 19th century Victorian liberalism in, 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 as, as we merging with, with a more social democratic settlement? Because I think if you look at the moral economy of liberalism, it seems to be based on three things. It's based on self-help, which you talk about. That those, you know, the principle there is that those who could support themselves should support themselves. That's you know, someone smiles, all of that. that the essence of Victorianism. Um, and the second thing is that there, there is a sort of entitlement to public support within liberalism, but those who, i.e. in terms of those who could not support themselves had a, had a right to expect assistance of some kind, assuming they were deserving, as Pat says. You had to be deserving to get this assistance. So it's entitlement with, with strings attached. Um, but I wonder, that, and the third thing is, I think, social obligation and mutual, mutuality, which fits with your, with, your, with your reciprocity idea, that, you know, it's, it's kind of big society, Victorian style, isn't it, where we're, we're bound together, um, we, we give back to each other. So there are those three things, there are three sort of planks of a liberal moral economy, but I wonder if we could just throw in also the idea of social investment. Do you see your, your people paying for treatment as making a sort of social investment? Do you see the people who are funding the hospitals and doing all the fundraising and raising all the money and the, in a, in the greater good, are they also making a social investment in something? And you talk about Giddens in your discussion of money, so I was just going to push the Giddens thing a little bit further. Thinking about Giddens' work on the social investment state. Now, by social investment state, he mean, he's talking about the post-welfare state, as in the 1970s, 80s, 1980s, 90s, you know, um, neoliberalism. We're now living in a social investment state where um, the state invests in us as, and it wants a return on its investment. It wants more productive workers. It wants people being more independent, not being a burden on services and so on. So it invests in order to get a return. Is there any sense of that language operating in your hospitals? Is, um, are, are, are we, in a way, thinking about... Is there, is there an early social model of the social investment state that we can look at? That's one of the things I would like to think about there. Um, so I think, finally, I think that you're right that we need more critical histories of payment. That, that I can't think of very many of them. And in a way, this is, this is a history of user fees, isn't it? Of, of, people paying for, 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 to engage in certain things, but that could be extended across education, across, say, the criminal justice system and stuff, recent stuff I've been looking at with uh, kids in youth reformatories. Their parents had to pay for the privilege of them being in there. So user fees were, were going across the system. Obviously, they were, were called that at the time. It's obviously a very current way of referring to it now. I also think a, history, a revised history of payment would help us think differently about the history of consumption and the consumption of public services, because I know you say they're not consumers, but they are consuming public service of some kind. You could, you could play, with the, play with the word consumption, um, I think, a little bit, a little bit more, we, we could. And the historians of consumption have been more interested in department stores and hospitals, or, or schools, or other things. Um, so I think... The book will make a big, big contribution, um, and I think we, could, we should have a, um, a panel on payment and consumption at next year's SHS mm -hmm. conference, 2018, and, uh, and I'm sure you'll get some great reviews. But thanks very much. And last but not least, uh, well, I'm going to be relatively brief here, um, just uh, again to. Um, the three words I I really enjoyed reading this book. I read it in manuscript, uh, I don't know, about a year or more than a year ago, actually. I lose track of time. Um, and George has been working with us um, until recently at the University of Warwick on a project on the cultural <laughs> history of the NHS. And um, his work on <coughs> pre NHS, and for me, my engagement with him, talking about his work on NHS has been hugely important really in terms of thinking about the NHS itself. 
Um, <clears throat> and reading through the book, I also got the sense that that's the important of the book. Um, and um, perhaps I'm just alert to it, but I kept, I kept on seeing kind of the, the comparisons to thinking about the NHS coming through. So I, I, I think it's been a very, um, hopefully a very productive um, uh, uh, situation to have someone who's been thinking about the pre-NHS working alongside people thinking about the NHS itself. Our project on the cultural history of the NHS is um, one of the central parts of it is trying to get at what did the NHS mean. Um, and we have powerful <laughs> beliefs in what the NHS means. Um, and I suspect that some of what George is saying anyway may jar a little bit, clash a little bit with some of people's popular expectations about what came before. Um, I think it would be fair to say that um, in the popular imagination at least, um, there is a, a, a very negative view of what came before. George alludes to a kind of body of work that he's sort of built upon, a kind of revisionist body of work if you want to, to, to call it that, that's paid a lot of attention to finance and, and to the role of the voluntary sector, to contributing schemes, etc. Um, uh, but I don't think that at a kind of popular level people are very familiar with <coughs> So I suspect, for some of us here at least, this has been a little bit of a surprise and kind of an interesting thing to, 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 to think with. Um, and I think for us on the cultural history of the NHS project, um, it's one of the big things that we do have to think about. Um, uh, the, the, the meaning of the NHS before as well as during. Um, George asked me to throw in a few reflections on how, you know, how how his work kind of could be useful moving forward and thinking about the NHS. And he 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 himself um, addressed that a little bit towards the end of, uh, of, of, of of his talk. I mean, obviously, one of the kind of big questions that we're always interested in history is kind of continuity and change question. Um, he, he uses some quite, time to think, quite provocative language, actually, um, alongside his very careful analysis in the book, where he talks about, um, he deploys the term universalism at, 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 at times, for example, which is a term that's been very much associated with the coming of the NHS. I think as Pat says, there is a there are kind of questions about typicality, you know, George does draw upon sort of national data, but a lot of it is based on a particular region. Um, and there's also big questions about his focus on hospital as, uh, as, 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 the, center, as the central feature. Um, but I do think that in some respects, in terms of access, you know, what he's saying is kind of very, very interesting. Um, I agree that that um, the class question is, 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 is fascinating. It's a very, very important part, part of his account. Um, uh, it, it does make one think that the people who did very well at the NHS, in part, were the middle classes by being brought into, well, when we're thinking about the, the hospital system, certainly, but actually when we think about the whole lot, actually, you know, um, that these were the people who were paying quite a lot b b b b b beforehand. Um, clearly, um, many poor people, as Pat's saying, you know, were deprived of, of certain services, etc. But in terms of hospital care, at least in in somewhere like Bristol, I think George is saying that actually there was a system at play, a complex system at play, a mixed economy system at play <coughs> that actually meant that most people could get hospital care. Um, so I think there are important questions, kind of about where does the system he's thinking about fit with the NHS in terms of continuity and, and change. And in terms of access, um, certainly something rather interesting is emerging in, 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 in his account. Um, second point, just quickly, um, the meaning question. I mean, actually, Pam, Pam really, um, uh, I, I thought, 
so probably most of what needs to be uh, said about that in terms of getting us to, 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 to think about it. But I do think it's one of the really interesting things that George is doing in this book, is, is asking us to think about um, uh, the meaning of, of, of payment. Um, his work in our project was trying to flip that, yeah? um, to think about the meaning of free. Um, and I think that um, uh, I'd be quite interested in him saying something uh, a, 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 a about that. Um, I mean, I wonder, I wonder whether it's easier to work on the medium of payment than the medium of free, actually. Yeah? I wonder whether it's that, those kind of boundaries where you are paying that, you know, <laughs> that you're going to get at. You're going to get at this stuff, actually, uh, in, in, in an interesting and I wonder whether within, within, whether within the NHS it's other things, although we often popularly assume that free was central to meaning, whether it was actually sometimes other things that actually sparked most powerful feelings and meanings. Interestingly, I was looking at um, some letters from people who wrote into a Women's Hour program from 1988 that was looking at pre-NHS care just this afternoon. Um, so people wrote in, heard the program, wrote in about their memories of pre-NHS care. Not one of them actually talked about payment. Maybe it's because it was the middle classes listening to, <laughs> listening to Women's Hour on, on Radio 4. Um, it was actually much more stuff about the sort of savagery of care. And about, about kind of the inhumanity of medicine um, and about, I guess often people having been children at the time and, and, and actually those kind of the other sorts of cultural change actually um, uh, uh, that um, provoked many of the most powerful meanings <laughs> rather than that economic thing that we assume is, 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 is always central. And then lastly, um, so popular politics. George talks a little bit about the Labour Party and things like that in, 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 in Bristol, etc. Um, I guess I'm interested in where um, you know where his work leaves us in terms of thinking about the popular politics of the coming of the NHS um, and whether the sorts of system that he's talking about, by and large, left people satisfied. Um, and whether actually we're talking about more of a kind of top-down process in terms of thinking that this needs to be more efficient, needs to be rationalised rather than a bottom-up politics um, of, of, of people feeling that this system does not work for us.